that's it. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what to do. <laughs> I would like to make a quick comment before I start. After reading through this, this obelisk has been standing here for 120 years. They did a really good job of doing it. <laughs> and it was a lot of work, I'm sure. That, that's the end of my opinions. We'll go on to the, the facts. I'm a little bit early. I don't know if I need that or not. Most people never say they can't hear me. Uh, my name is Dan Whitlock. I'm with the part of this group, but I'm not the honor here. Uh, I asked some of you earlier, and some of you did go down. There's a sign-up register down there in that black box on the pole. Those numbers are real important to us because when we need to ask for things, especially things that cost money, we want to know if anybody comes up here. So if you would sign that thing as you go out, uh, the more names on there, the better it is for us. So if you get a chance, please do that. It would help us a lot. Thank you. Today we gather to commemorate the 217th anniversary of the death and burial of Sergeant Floyd and to tell of his early life, his death, and four burials. Many historians have called um, Charles Floyd, called him Charles Floyd Jr., but he was not junior. Born in 1782 at Floyd Station, now St. Matthew, a suburb of Louisville, Kentucky. His father was Robert Clark Floyd, 1752 to 1807. His, his mother was Lily Ann or Lillian Hampton Floyd. Sister Elizabeth R. or Betsy, born in 1773 in Virginia. A brother, Davis, born 1774 in Virginia. Another sister, Mary Lee, born 1794 in Jefferson County, Kentucky. Charles rolled the mail weekly from Louisville to Vincennes, Indiana, 1802 to 1803, 110 miles each way, $600 per year plus $50 hazard pay because he stayed along the road in, in an area of Indians. His brother-in-law, Thomas Wynn, was postmaster in Louisville in 1802. His father and brother, Davis, operated a ferry across the Ohio River from Clarksville, Indiana to Louisville. Charles may have helped on occasion. Charles was chosen by William Clark as one of the young men from Kentucky. He was enlisted in the U.S. Army for the Lewis and Clark Expedition on August 1, 1803 at Pond Settlement near Louisville at 21 years of age. He was appointed sergeant on January 1, 1804 at Camp Du Bois, Wood River, Illinois. He was put in charge of the second squad of eight men. He was the youngest of three sergeants. Nathaniel Hale Pryor was his cousin, another of the young men from Kentucky, was 32, John Ordway, was 29 and was regular army. As a private, he made $5 a month and $8 a month as sergeant. $61.33, one third of which of each went to his heirs. His sisters and brother received this plus a land warrant of 320 acres. He gave up $600 per year for the chance to go with Lewis and Clark. A great opportunity or a great adventure for a young man. The land grant of 320 acres was a great reward to be given, a princely sum. The expedition left St. Charles, Missouri on May 21, 1804. They came into the area of what is now Iowa, Nebraska in mid-July. On July 22, 1804, they made camp on the east bank of the river they came to call White Catfish, where they laid over until July 27th. On July 31st, they were in the area of what is now Fort Atkinson State Park in Nebraska. This is where they met with the Otos and the Missouris. This is where on July 31, Sergeant Floyd wrote in his journal, I am very sick and has been for some time. 
but have recovered my health again. On July 30th, Clark had written in his field notes, Sergeant Floyd, very unwell, bad cold, etc., and several men with boils. August 11th, Floyd wrote in his journal that he had visited Blackbird's grave with the captains, and they planted a flag to honor him, which pleased the Indians much. August 15th, 1804, Floyd wrote in his journal, Captain Clark and 10 of his men and myself went to the Mahas Creek a fishing and caught 300 and 17 fish of different kinds. Our men has not returned yet. Men were searching for Moses Reed, who had deserted, and Liberté, a French engagee, who had also left. At this time, they were in the area of what is today Homer, Nebraska, at an old Omaha village site to locate and meet with the Omahas, but they were gone on a buffalo hunt. August 18th, Floyd's last entry in his journal. Our men returned and brought with them the man Reed and brought with them three grand chief of the Otos and two lower ones and six other others of their nation. A, cart, a court martial was held for Reed that day. It was Lewis's 30th birthday and he issued the men an extra gill of whiskey and a gill is four ounces so they had eight ounces of liquor. And Cousat played the fiddle until the men danced until 11 o'clock. August 19th. We determined to set out early in the morning. Sergeant Floyd is taken very bad all at once with the bellious collar. We attempted to relieve him without success as yet. He gets worse and we are much alarmed at his situation. All attention to him. Clark from his field notes, notes by Osgood, August 19th. Sergeant Floyd was taken violently bad with a bellious colic and is dangerously ill. We attempt in vain to relieve him. I am much concerned for his situation. We could get nothing to stay on his stomach a moment. One word here is ineligible. Appear exhausting fast in him. Every man is attentive to him, York principally. Patrick Gass, Joseph Whitehouse, and John Ordway all wrote in their journals that on the 19th, Sergeant Floyd was taken suddenly ill with a violent collar. August 20th, Monday, Clark wrote, I am dull and heavy. Been up the greater part of the last night with Sergeant Floyd, who is bad as he can be to live. The motion of his bowels having changed, etc., etc., is the cause of his violent attack, etc., etc. Patrick Gass wrote on the 20th, Sergeant Floyd continued very ill. We embarked early and proceeded having a fair wind and fine weather till two o'clock when we landed for dinner. Here Sergeant Floyd died. Notwithstanding every possible effort was made by the commanding officers and other persons to save his life. We went on about a mile to a high prairie hills on the north side of the river and there interred his remains in the most decent manner our circumstances would admit. We then proceeded a mile further to a small river of the same side and encamped. Our commanding officers gave it the name of Floyd's River to perpetuate the memory of the first man who had fallen on this important mission. Private Joseph White, Whitehouse wrote, The disease which occasioned his death was a bilious colic, which baffled all medical aid that Captain Lewis could administer. We laid him out in the most decent manner possible. We then proceeded on to the first hills on the north side of the river, where we dug a grave on top of a high round knob and interred him with all the honors of war and had a funeral service preached over him. We named this hill Sergeant Floyd's Bluff. We proceeded on to a creek lying in the same side of the river which we named Sergeant Floyd's Creek and encamped. Clark wrote on the 20th, Sergeant Floyd much weaker and no better. Made Mr. Fawthorne the interpreter a few presents and the Indians a canister of whiskey. We set out under a gentle breeze from the southeast and proceeded on very well. Sergeant Floyd, as bad as he can be, and nothing will stay a moment on his stomach or bowels. Past two islands on the south side, uh, at the first bluff on the south side, we came to make a warm bath for Sergeant Floyd, hoping it would brace him a little. Before we could get him into this bath, he expired with a great deal of composure, having said to me before his death that he was going away and wished me to write a letter. We buried him to the top of a high hill overlooking the river with his and his country for a great distance, situated just below a small river without a name, to which we name and call Floyd's River, the bluff, Sergeant Floyd's Bluff. 
We buried him with all the honors of war and fixed a cedar post at his head with his name, title, day of the month and year. Captain Lewis read the funeral services over him after paying every respect to the body of this deceased man, which had at all times given us proof of his impartiality, sincerity to ourselves, and goodwill to serve his country. We returned to the boat and proceeded to the mouth of a little river 30 yards wide and camped a beautiful evening. Sergeant Ordway had written, we set off under a gentle breeze. The Indian chiefs set out to return to their village. Sergeant Floyd worse than yesterday. Sergeant Floyd expired directly after we halted. A little past the middle of the day, we dug a grave on a handsome, slightly rounded knob close to the bank. We buried him with the honors of the war. The usual ceremony performed by Captain Lewis as is customary in a settlement. We put a red cedar post and hung it and branded his name and date. We named these bluff Sergeant Floyd's bluff distance from the mouth of the Missouri was 949 and a half miles by water. Where did we go here? That's not making sense. We then We then proceeded on a short distance to a creek we saw, Floyd's Creek. Came 15 or 18 miles today. What was this bilious colic which felled young Charles, and what did the captains do to treat him? The medicines of the time. No one understood germs or viruses, or any of what we know today. Um, the medicine had gone from medicine had gone from good or ill humors, as the Greeks had called them to inflammation or morbid conditions and nervous irritability. That which was in the body and causing problems had to be removed, depleted, and the major methods for doing this were amaretic to make the patient vomit. Are you ready for this? A diuretic to make urine flow, a diaphoretic to make the patient sweat, or a purgative or laxative to open the bowels, or by bleeding the patient. Dr. Rush, to whom Lewis had been sent for medical information, was a great believer in bleeding and purging with the use of his bilious pills. A strong laxative um, made with uh, 10 to 15 grains of jalap, the root of a Mexican morning glory, which gave you a runny diarrhea, and 10 to 15 grains of mercurous chloride, which made it an explosive runny diarrhea. Make your day. The captains undoubtedly gave Floyd an emetic. Some of Dr. Rush's purgative pills, called by many Dr. Rush's thunderbolts or thunderclappers, <laughs> for the action they caused, and also bled him. Did they help him to die quicker? Very possibly. But he had been in Philadelphia with, had he been in Philadelphia with Dr. Rush, he would have received the same treatment. The captains were doing the very best they could with the knowledge they had. Many doctors have believed that what Floyd suffered from was a ruptured appendix with peritonitis. It was 1812 before a physician said that a ruptured appendix and peritonitis could cause death. And 1884 before a successful appendectomy was performed. And young Floyd fit that profile. We still have today. White males between the ages of 20 and 24 have the highest incidence of appendicitis of any age group and either, gen either gender. Gentlemen,
everybody for being here this afternoon. I'm going to go through the commands here and explain to you what we're actually going to do. Boys, your fire locks. So we're going to bring the guns to the center and hold them up. Make ready your fire locks. The cock the hammer back and ready to fire. when his call shall come, nor is it fitting that he should be so foreknowledged. It behooves all men to know this truth and profit thereby. Man that lives each day in the fulfillment of his duties and in the maintenance of his honor shall not fear to face this final judgment whensoever wheresoever it may come. Our brother in arms, Charles Floyd, has answered this call to judgment and has done so in the service of his nation, the furtherance of the aims and instructions of his government. His sacrifice is real and the same value as if he had fallen in battle. Our comrade went to his end bravely with a great deal of composure and dignity. So let us profit by that example. Should the occasion arise, which calls us to follow on that unknown pathway, which he has so bravely trod in advance of those of us who remain in this earthly realm. Let us proceed on to complete the great enterprise on which we are engaged. For in doing so in a soldierly manner, we shall create the grandest memorial to our fallen comrade. God bless him, keep him safe, may he rest in peace.
The cedar post at Floyd's grave on the rounded knob, 60 feet above the river, was a marker for all fur traders and travelers using the Missouri River in the following years, George Catlin wrote about the grave site of Floyd. Where heaven sheds its purest light and sheds its richest tints, this round-topped bluff where foot treads soft and light, whose steep sides and lofty head reach to the skies, overlooking yonder pictured veil of beauty. This solitary cedar post tells a tale of grief, grief that was keenly felt and tenderly, but long since softened in the march of time and lost. Oh, sad and tear-starting contemplation, sole tenant of this stately mound. How solitary thy habitation. Here heaven wrested from thee thy ambition and made thee sleeping monarch of this land of silence. Stranger, oh, how thy mystic web of sympathy links, links to my soul and thee and thy afflictions. I knew thee not, but it was enough. Thy tale was told, and I, a solitary wanderer through thy land, have stopped to drop a familiar tears upon thy grave. Pardon this gush from a stranger's eyes, for they are all that thou canst have in this strange land. There were, were friends and dear relations are not allowed to pluck a flower and drop a tear to freshen recollections of endearments past. Stranger, adieu, with streaming eyes I leave thee again and thy fairy land to peaceful solitude. My pencil has faithfully traced thy beautiful habitation and long shall live in the world and familiar the name of Floyd's grave. In the spring of 1857, the Missouri River running fast and wild cut the bluff that Ordway said had been close to the bank. The grave gave up the bones of Sergeant Floyd, gave up some of the bones of Sergeant Floyd and as many were rescued as possible. The skull, leg bones, scapula, and others. The bones were taken to Judge Noah Levering's house to be kept until they could be reburied. But his wife did not want them in her house. So they were taken to Judge Marshall Moore's house. I have not been able to find out if he was a bachelor or if his wife was less squeamish about <laughs> such things. <laughs> a new coffin was built, and on May 28, 1857, a, the coffin with Floyd's remains was taken by a ferry boat Lewis, Lewis Burns to the bluff and reinterred in a patriotic and religious ceremony. The new grave site was some 600 feet southeast back on the bluff from the original site with wooden head and foot, hip footboards to mark it. There was a discussion in 1857 of a monument, but nothing came of it. Floyd rested in peace until the early 1890s. In 1893, his journal was discovered by Reuben Gold Thwaites at the Wisconsin Historical Society. Professor James D. Butler of Madison, Wisconsin, learned of the journal, presented a paper on it to the American Antiquarian Society in April of 1894, and they subsequently published it. These events, along with Elliot Koo's edition of the Lewis and Clark journals, stirred new interest in the expedition, especially in Sioux City. The Sioux City Journal carried articles, Marie Floyd and his grave, and the idea of erecting a monument to honor him. The association was proposed by interested people and a plan for it was realized. There was only one problem. The grave could not be found. In 1857, the head and foot markers had been broken off and the remains were below ground level. An attempt early in 1895 to find the grave failed. Another attempt was made in May 30, 1895, and this search was met with success. Using faded memories and a more scientific method of probing for color differences in the soil, a grave was found. Because they wanted other witnesses to be on hand for the exhumation, especially those who had been there for the 1857 ceremonies, they postponed further digging until June 6 of 1895. That day the digging revealed moldering wood coffin and it was uncovered. The identification was deemed successful and on the spot, Floyd Memorial Association was formed. The decision was made to remove the skull to town for safekeeping and to recover the grave at that time. The journal covered the activities and the founding of the association and plans were made for reburial ceremonies on August 20th, 1895. Mitchell Vincent platted the bluff and determined that Floyd's 1804 grave was now 100 feet in the air over the Missouri and the 1857 grave was 360 feet 
from the solid edge of the railroad cut on the western edge of the bluff. At the June 24th meeting, John Hur Charles was elected president of the association. A monument was very important to him. Elliot Coos and Professor Butler were to be invited to the August 20 ceremonies and land for a park for the grave had to be acquired and suitable receptacles for Floyd's bones to be procured. It was decided at this meeting to use a marble slab, seven by three by eight inches thick, $40 to mark the grave site and a pottery urn to hold the bones. Coos suggested the skull be kept at the museum, but it was buried with the other bones. Two plaster casts were made of the skull as phrenology was a thing of the day. And one thing was given to Sioux City Museum and one to the Iowa uh, Historical Society. P.C. Walter Meyer of Sioux City was a photographer, at least of the grave views, and we have him to thank for the photos of 1895, 1900, and 1901. On August 20th, 1894, 19, August 20th, 1895, the bones now removed from the 1857 grave site were placed in two earth, earthenware urns and a train load of people was taken to the site. Others arrived in their own conveyances for the ceremonies. Professor James Butler held Floyd's journal in place of a Bible for delivering a funeral oration. There were many speeches, the urns were lowered into the grave and a wreath of flowers were placed on them and the grave filled in. The inscribed marble slab was placed, so that's the third time he was buried. The association began planning the monument. There were several years of planning and fundraising. By 1899, they had received 5,000 from Congress, 5,000 from the state of Iowa. Funds were raised from the public as well. We have the records of $1 given by so-and-so and so-and-so, -and -so, the list of all who gave. The final negotiations were made uh, for the 21 bluff top acres around the Floyd grave site for a park and discussions with the Corps of Engineers about planning and construction of a monument. By May 1900, they had enough money to proceed with the plans designed by the Corps. Hiram M. Chittenden of the Corps oversaw the construction with his assistant engineer, Bathurst Smith. Chittenden's design of the Egyptian obelisk would be an imposing appearance visible at great distance and dominating the valley in its vicinity. Kettle River sandstone from Minnesota quarry was selected. By late May 1900, plans, finances, and ceremony arrangements were in place. Next was to be the pouring of a foundation to be followed after that by the obelisk. May 29th, 1900, 110 men left the railroad station at 7 a.m. Half an hour later, hand-mixed concrete was being hand-poured. It was to be poured in one day so it could cure as one solid mass. Solid mass it was, 22 feet square at the base, 14 feet square at the top, 11 feet high, with 32 heavy iron rails interlaced through it. 138.6 cubic yards of concrete. It weighed some 200 tons. Chittenden estimated that it would take 10 hours, and the last shovel of concrete was placed at 5.30, and by 6 p.m. the men were headed for home. Following tradition, the association decided that August 20th would be the date to lay the cornerstone. They would transfer Floyd's remains to the center of the monument for permanent entombment. So again, August 20th, 1900, in the a.m., the urns were exhumed again, placed in the center of the foundation to be covered with concrete, and by the afternoon ceremonies, a time capsule was, by Mayor A.H. Burton, placed beside the urns in the center of a monument at the base, and concrete was placed over them. There was a mixed military religious cemetery ceremony. Final address was made, America was played. There were three volleys and taps ended the ceremony for the fourth interment of Floyd's remains. Blocks were laid as they were delivered, and 16 courses were laid by the end of October. 55 feet had been completed. Work resumed on March 18, 1901. High winds slowed the work, but on April 22, the capstone was laid. Work on the shaft was complete. Height 100.174 feet. The base was 9.42 square. The weight of the shaft, 278 tons. Six blocks were used for each course. The shaft decreased by one-third from the base to the top. The bronze tablet on the east and west were placed. 
Roadway from the public highway was done, and then steel fence were all completed by late May for the Memorial Day dedication, May 30th, 1901. The paving around the monument will be completed later. Participants and spectators, new and old, gathered around Sergeant Floyd, uh, the grave of Sergeant Floyd. Professor James Butler with the, the precious Floyd's journal was there. Judge Noah Levering from the 1857 came from Los Angeles. A crowd of an estimated 2,000 people for a $20,000 monument. The bronze tablets were unveiled. Descendants of Thomas Jefferson was one of the speakers. A bugler blew retreat. There was a volley of three and 24 guns and taps. A fitting monument to, as Lewis said, a young man of much merit. The first American soldier to die west of the Mississippi. The only man to die on the expedition. Now, after four burials, Sergeant Floyd rests in peace at the core of this obelisk monument that was designated the first National Historic Monument in 1960 by the Department of Interior. Today we remember Sergeant Charles Floyd. 217 years later, we salute him with a poem by Will Reed Dunroy from 1901 that was published in the Sioux City Tribune on May 30th, 1901. Get to read poetry. And it's actually good. He sleeps beneath the stately shaft, beside the winding river, where prairie grasses clothe the sod and stunted willows quiver. The waters murmur as they flow, in a requiem softly faintly low, and the west winds sigh and shiver. No one can reach his earthly spot, stop tears, however loudly spoken. To words of praise, to words of blame, his dust give no token. He holds his vigil on the hill in endless quiet, deep and still, in dignity, in dignity unbroken. Above his solemn resting place, the meadow larks are singing. Around the stately obelisk, the butterflies are winging. With reverence and peace draw near, the grave of sleeping pioneer and peons of praise are ringing. His restless feet have turned to dust, his wanderings are ended, but still his spirit bides with us with courage high and splendid. His strong example paved the way for all the triumphs of today. His hopes on us descended. He sleeps beneath the stately shaft, enwrapped in solemn glory. Eternal hills lift up their heads about him, old and hoary. And like a finger pointing high, the shaft lifts upward, lifts upward to the sky and tells its deathless story. Will D. Dunlop. This poem was contained in an extended editorial and account of the dedication of Floyd Monument, published in the Sioux City Tribune on May 30th, 1901. That concludes the program. Thank you so much for coming, and I feel this is a very important event, especially for Sioux City, so I really appreciate you being here. If you want to take pictures of the soldiers, 